Welcome back to the Student Hub Live Proud in 50 event from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at The Open University. This session is called Digital Turn and I'm joined by Sophie Watson and Jess Perriam. Uh, now Sophie, you're a professor in sociology and you're currently on the team producing DD218. And your main uh, areas of interest are in urban sociology, multiculturalism, public space. And you're going to talk to us a little bit later through smart cities, which is really exciting. And Jess, you're a lecturer in sociology here and you're working on the DD218 Understanding Digital Societies. So that puts you in a very good position to talk about this topic. And throughout our sessions earlier, we've been talking about the extent to which digital has transformed the way that we're teaching and the opportunities provided. But here we're going to really focus initially on sociology. So Sophie, I wonder if you can give us a brief outline about what sociology was like 50 years ago. Even I wasn't around then teaching it. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the sort of early part of sociology, which was sort of the 60s really when mm -hmm. it took off in Britain, um, LSE being quite an important institution at that time, drew on ideas that were developed in the 19th and into the 20th century. So the three key sort of thinkers at that time would have been Karl Marx, Max Weber and Emil Durkheim. And a lot of sociology departments would have those three key thinkers as part of their sort of foundation course. Marx was um, uh, known for talking about class and issues to do with capitalism and class and so on. Uh, Weber was more interested in institutions and bureaucracy and Durkheim was kind of interested in the idea of sort of social facts, how society worked. So that was kind of where it started. And then things began to shift by the time we move into the late 60s and early 70s. So from three very key thinkers with quite contained ideas, I guess things have moved on a lot you know, now. So, so now, whilst you might expect to see some of those names in sociology, um, there are very different ideas in the following decades, aren't there? That's right. I mean, when you come into the 70s, I think sociology becomes, a, if you like, a more politicised discipline. Mm. I mean, certainly not across all sociology departments by any means, but it became a discipline that interested people who were thinking in more kind of radical ways. Mm. So the influence of Marxist sociology became much more important. Issues of class became more important. And connected to that were issues of race and ethnicity and also feminism. So by the time you move into the sort of mid 70s, late 70s, feminism is beginning to have a much stronger voice. And that's kind of thinking about the relationship between um, an understanding of patriarchy and an understanding of class and trying to bring those things together. We then move on to another period, really. I mean, this is very sort of simple characterization, but you move into a period in the 80s when you get in influences from other thinkers again, people like Michel Foucault from France. That's called sort of post-structuralism, thinking about the way in which bodies are disciplined. He's very interested in institutions in a different way from Max Weber. He's interested in prisons and the health system and so on and how these things form us uh, as individuals. So... Uh, these, you mentioned some of these sort of key ideas. Were they the main sort of themes of things that people might expect to learn about, the ideas that were really taught at the time? Well, I've actually missed out there when I was talking about um, other thinkers because, in fact, I've missed out uh, Chalcott Parsons, for example, who was very influential when sociology found its voice in the 70s, uh, 60s and into the 70s. Um, Talcott Parsons, who was an American sociologist, he was talking about the family, the role of the family in keeping society together. You have um, Irving Goffman, who was very important as well, and he was talking about the, the presentation of self in society, and that was about, um, he was interested in things like asylums and so on. So you have a kind of bunch of thinkers, and then uh, C. Wright Mills, who's very important, and, and somebody we come back to in our course, actually, in DD218 who I'd had an idea of the sociological imagination. So you, you get a sort of bunch of new thinkers before the ones I was just talking, before the influence of Marx and feminism takes off, in that middle period, who started to develop different ideas and different uh, foci. So you, you have a, an interest in, say, religion, for example. Um, at, but both Weber and Durkheim are interested. Well, in fact, all the three 19th century thinkers are interested in the role of religion in society. Marx said religion was the opium of the people. It stopped people being able to see class, class conflict, for example. Um, so, yes, you begin to see different sorts of systems and institutions being analysed through a sociological lens. Now, you're both working on this module, DD218, at the moment. Um, but with such sort of key defined ideas and things, how are you bringing that into the now? And, and where is sociology at right now and why is it so important? I think we can take some of these ideas and kind of 
look at them through the lens of what we're experiencing right now. So as Sophie mentioned, um, Evan Goffman talks about the presentation of self in everyday life and a lot of that is looking at how people interact with one another and how we can um, kind of understand and read one another. What happens when you take that online on social media and you start um, talking to people but you can't read their facial expressions or you can't get a sense of of class or or kind of anything like that. So I think there's a real opportunity with the digital to look at some of these ideas and say, well, how might the way that we interact online these days and interact whether that's in social ways or with government or or kind of in our work settings and how does that, um, how might some of these theories be challenged or seen in a new light. So that's what we're trying to do in the very early stages of DD218, kind of giving those tools so that students can go and have a look at some issues that they might find in their everyday life and kind of think about them that way. So what you're saying is, it's like, here's a concept. This is something that's really important, very, very influential. But hey, let's look at it now within this digital context and see how things have shifted. Absolutely. Brilliant. So how, how has the digital then influenced anything in terms of maybe things that we're able to look at or various lenses or methods, ways in which we're able to explore, explore new ideas? Yeah, absolutely. So with digital sociology, um, Norcha Maris, who's a sociologist, um, based up at Warwick. She talks about digital sociology being kind of the digital as a setting that we can do research in, the digital as a tool that we can do research with, and also as a, as a method in and of itself. So there's lots of ways that you can think about the digital in sociology in that sense. Mm. Now we've been looking at the past and the future in, in today's programme and I wonder if we might sort of nip back a little bit to the past. Um, and Sophie, um, you know, the Open University has obviously had a long history with some of these, some very influential people. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about some of those people who were teaching in the past and, and we've got some clips and things to show our yes. audience as well. Well, we were very lucky because um, the first professor of sociology, well, not the first, but one of the first professors of sociology at the Open University was Stuart Hall. And uh, Stuart Hall was very, very influential on the way that sociology changed, really, through the 80s. And he came from having set up a cultural studies, or he was the second person, actually, to direct a cultural studies centre in Birmingham. And what you begin to see through the 70s and into the 80s uh, is a focus on culture rather than the social. The notion that many, many aspects of culture are often neglected and not thought about. And it does rather relate to what Jess was saying. Um, it brings into questions of, uh, say, everyday life. Um, you know, he, one of the, 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 the courses Stuart did very early on for the OU took the Sony Walkman, which was a technology most people probably don't remember, but it was the kind of precursor to iPods and, and, and being able to listen to MP uh, on, your, on your phone. Um, this, was, this was sort of the focus of one of the courses, and it was trying to take these kind of objects, which are objects of everyday life, um, and think about how they translated into uh, reforming uh, society and, and, and social. I think we have a clip from Stuart Hall we might look at. Yes, let's have a look. Just lining that clip up for people at home right now. Okay, we'll come back to that in just one second. Um, now, if we may then, just before we sort of show that clip, you were talking before about some of the sort of um, new ideas that you were using in DD218 as well. Can you give us a little bit of a flavour, Jess, about what some of those things are that students might expect in that module? Yeah, so we're, we're breaking the module into, into four blocks or four chunks. So the first one is looking at the sociological imagination. So looking at C. Wright Mills's idea of um, individual troubles uh, relating to public issues. So how is what we experience in our everyday lives are uh, kind of symptomatic of what we what could be happening in broader society. So austerity is one good way about thinking about that. So individual food bank usage is a symptom of everything that's happening in austerity. So we're looking at that and thinking about how do we see that in digital settings and how can we measure that and how can we research that. Um, in the second block, we're looking at um, transnational communities and migration and how they use technology to keep in touch with families across nations and continents and, um, and also looking at um, refugees and their use of, um, of technology 
in the migrant crisis. So we have Marie Gillespie um, doing some brilliant work on that for us. And also looking at the smart city. So Sophie and Liz McFall is doing some of the work on that. In the third block, we're looking at, um, at AI and robots and that kind of thing, and looking at how humans actually relate to non-human objects. So that's, that's really fascinating. Um, and then in the final block, we're looking at all of the kind of theories and ideas that we've been looking at and looking at some of the key issues in society today that the digital is implicated in. So um, cyber security and um, conflict minerals. So what's the sociological implications of the, the metals and materials that make up our smartphones and other technology? And then we're looking at a whole range of other things as well. It's really exciting. So some massive questions there and, and a huge shift away from the way things were in the past. We've got, we've got that clip ready for you now, Sophie, sorry. Disappeared in the digital technology. <laughs> <laughs> Just a Would you like to um, see that now then, yeah? The Stuart yes. Hall clip. Right, let's take a look at this. Um, so this is something uh, from, from the way old past. But the OU differs from other universities in also making very considerable use of radio, cassettes and television. And these are not just fancy bits added on to courses. The different parts of the course, written materials, set books, radio and TV, are all designed to work together. But each element also has its special part to play. It does something which the other media can't do, or can't do as well. All of us listen to the radio or watch television as part of our normal lives. And often we don't think very hard about what we're hearing and seeing. But you'll find that you won't get much out of OU radio and TV programs if you don't first of all learn to think of them as essential parts of the course. You have to get yourself into a particular frame of mind if the radio, cassette and TV parts of the course are really to help you to learn. So very reminiscent, Sophie, of some of the things you were mentioning earlier. It's actually interesting because one of the ways in which sociology has changed more recently and which um, Jess is talking about is the importance of thinking about objects. Mm. For a long time we didn't really think about objects. It was more you thought about the notion of the social, mm. which was sort of devoid of objects. It was devoid of a materiality. And although Stuart didn't work within a framework that um, foregrounded the notion of the material, this has become much later with people like Bruno Latour and thinkers of the last, who've been influential in the last 10 years. It's, it's kind of like we actually thought about these things very early on in the OU, and it was through the lens of culture. So he was looking at these things through the lens of culture. Whereas now, the course, the DD218 course, I think, is very much looking at objects and the, their relation and how they make the world in certain kinds of ways. We use this idea of what's called affordances, you know, how, what, 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 what is made possible via an object. So actually, I think Stuart was sort of ahead of his time. Mm. He was always ahead of his time. And in terms of objects, I mean, one of the things I'd like to talk about is this idea of the smart cities. You've mentioned, Jess, that it's, it's something included within the module, but it's also something that you're working on, Sophie. We did some research. We had a research project um, which was run out of the Geography and Sociology Department. Gillian Rose, who's Professor of Geography here, um, was the, the, the person behind the, the programme. And Milton Keynes itself calls itself a smart city. And it's the way in which the digital has reconfigured city life that we were interested in. And there's all sorts of examples of that from, you know, the, the, the Google cars, the smart cars, through to sensors in the street, through to smart energy solutions to get people to consume less electricity or less water and so on. So it's, a, it's become a very fashionable way of um, analysing cities, the, the, the notion of the digital and how it's transformed urban life. We asked people at home, um, did you notice how cities and urban services are getting smarter um, and what have you noticed? So let's see what they have to say at home. Bus stops are a key thing here. Smart homes, smart traffic lights, smart cities, street lights, weather, <laughs> um, driverless trains, traffic flows, Wi-Fi broadband traffic jams and more satellite dishes. So some of those very obvious objects perhaps that, um, that people have noticed as an embodiment of, of smarter cities. Yes, I think that's right. And, and this relates to the course as well in terms of, you might like to talk about the health, you know, the health apps that are quite important. Yeah, so Simon Carter um, looks in block three about some of the health apps and more kind of the fitness side of apps and how they become social. I think he, he made a really interesting point um, 
last week just in discussion about um, about the way that people present themselves, say, on Strava or or an app like that. So they're presenting the fittest version of themselves, whereas maybe on a dating profile they would uh, present a different version of themselves or maybe there would be some overlaps between the two. So um, it's really interesting from that kind of social and cultural perspective, but also um, tracking and tracking devices is, uh, they're really fascinating as well because you're generating so much data and um, you have to think, well, who, who has access to this data and, and what's going to happen? So we also begin to ask questions about what happens to the data that we generate in digital societies and, and what can happen as a result of that. So another thing that we look at is um, algorithms and that's right at the very end of the module. But thinking about what, what do governments or corporations do with our data and is it, is it fair, is it good? What, what, what are the good things that can happen and what are the, the, uh, the less positive things that can happen as well? And I think it's important to, uh, to say that in this module, we're kind of trying to strike a middle ground between technologies, neither a terrible thing nor a, a really perfect thing either. We're, we're giving students critical skills to think about that and and do the analysis themselves. Well, you didn't give them very critical skills for our widgets because you said, do you think technology is good for society? Yes, no, or oh, not sure. Well, 67% said that they do think technology is on the whole good for society. Um, so that's very interesting. We also asked whether people had um, their water or electricity on smart meters. 57% said that they do have. So these are clearly people watching who um, are already engaging with some of these things. Um, and we also asked, do you think that knowing more about how much energy you use would reduce your energy? energy use and 67% of our audience today said yes they did um, with the remainder split between them. But what I'm interested in is I mean these are very topical things these apps these various things anybody could be studying them so what makes sociology and the various sort of things that are coming to it from this discipline important? I mean we, I, we probably both answer that and uh, say perhaps different things but the, the point of sociology is we are investigating or interrogating how objects, these kinds of objects, in this case digital objects, reconfigure notions of the social. Mm. What kinds of things do they make possible? What kinds of connections do they make possible? I mean, this relates to one of my interests in, in, um, in, in cities, for example. I mean, who is it who's being included in the smart city and who isn't? We had a big study in our, in our research about the um, visually impaired. Mm. Um, visually impaired people were developing apps so that they could actually move around the city more easily. So you're looking at much more um, sociological questions in terms of inclusion, exclusion, differences. Difference has been a long standing interest in sociology, particularly since the 70s and since Stuart Hall's work on multiculturalism. We're not equally powerful in society. You know, power uh, lies under a lot of these questions and sociologists have always looked at questions of power. That relates to questions of gender, it relates to questions of race, it relates to questions of class. These are abiding questions that we're interested in. Yeah, absolutely. I'd back up what Sophie says and just say that we're, we are really thinking about, um, from a sociological perspective, about power and inequality and how those two relate to one another and how they might um, be exacerbated in digital settings. So we are spending a bit of time thinking about misinformation online mm -hmm. and the power and inequality that's at play there. And, and I think sociology is really well placed to give a theoretical perspective because we're already thinking about society. So um, in digital settings, it's, it's society happening in that space. Mm. We asked people at home, and I think you'll find this interesting, what are some of the negative aspects of technology? So let's see what people said. We can see cost here, but interesting things like access for the elderly, lack of focus, expensive interpersonal, loneliness, broadband, heavily reliance, uh, heavy reliance, time wasting, buffering, crime scams, lack of patience and bullying. Dependency also coming up there as well. I mean, you mentioned, Sophie, this idea about, you know, um, various inequalities, who's included and who's excluded. And so here what we can see is, is some groups obviously feeling marginalised or not being benefited from, from technology. Yeah, I mean, if you think of it, I did some work on, this, on the smart water, introduction, introduction of smart water systems. I think you said something like 
quite a high percentage of people were actually using smart meters. Yeah, sixty-seven percent said that. Oh, sorry, fifty-seven percent are using an energy. Uh, were using a, a smart meter. Well, the interesting question for sociologists would be who they were, but also who the forty-three percent were who weren't. Mm -hmm. um, we found there was really strong age differences, gender differences, ethnicity differences, mm -hmm. and education, for example. The people who were often indifferent to using smart meters were often the richer, oddly. The people who were more concerned about energy use would have been the older people who'd been through the war and were more used to conserving their, their money. You know, so you find these kinds of social differentiations permeating the, the life of the digital, mm -hmm. permeating society always. And that's always been something that sociologists are interested in. The idea that society is not a homogenous thing we're not all the same. We become different. We become different through different cultures, through different material circumstances, through different histories. We take a lot of this for granted, but once you start interrogating these things with a sociological lens, you see that these are, are generated in very complex ways. I suppose one could say that the sociolo sociological lens makes life more complex, or at least entertains more complex ways of understanding things beyond the way in which you know, facile comments are made by journalists in, in, in tabloids or, or maybe a dinner party conversation where people pontificate after a few glasses of wine. Sociologists are trying to say, but it's not as simple as that. Mm. And perhaps even different motivations. I mean, you talk about, you know, people who have been in the war not wanting to waste, but equally young people these days are so mindful of future resources. So again, it could be a very similar motivation, but for very different reasons, which again further complicates things, as you say. Yes, that's a really mm. interesting way in which different groups might come together in different kinds of alliances and make different connections in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Mm -hmm. Perhaps again because of these affordances that you were mentioning earlier, Jess. We also asked people at home about some of the positive aspects of technology. Um, so let's see what things came up there. Speed, <laughs> education, innovation, singularity, accessibility, connectivity, empowering, management, knowledge, communications, washing machines, interactivity, better sectors and accessibility. Very interesting there. I mean, accessibility has been something that's featured both on the negative and positive side of things. Again, perhaps with slightly different context, motivations or backgrounds in mind. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that time was quite big and speed as well. Mm. Um, there have been sociologists and primarily feminist sociologists such as Judy Weissman at the LSE who have actually had a look at how technology has impacted or, or not impacted as the case may be the gender balance in households. So it has, has the washing machine and all of these other home devices allowed women to have more time to devote to things outside of the home and she would kind of tend to say not and that's that's a problem like what's the point of technology if it doesn't liberate everybody equally there was an argument wasn't there about technology actually making people even more sort of conscious of having to be house proud so rather than it taking those jobs away and making them easier then people the expectations rose as to you know what you could do at home so so now you know you you expect to have a cappuccino machine and make your cappuccinos whereas before you might have just got a kettle and poured it on your Nescafe. So, you know, technology makes, makes life, uh, as it were, more complicated sometimes. Yeah, we can do so much, but we're expected to do it to a higher standard in some respect mm -hmm. to, to show that we have cultural capital or economic capital, as Bourdieu would say. And that's one of the other key thinkers that we explore in DD218. So looking at, well, if we're, if we're showing ourselves off online, what exactly are we doing and what do we hope to achieve by doing that? Yes, of course. And, and this online thing is, is just so massive for us in so many different ways, I think, and will present such a wealth of things to study. So when is the module available? It's available from uh, 2020 onwards. Brilliant. Excellent. We'll look forward to finding out more. And I'm sure you'll come back and tell us all about it when, uh, when it's due for launch. But uh, Jess and Sophie, thank you so much for coming along. It's been a really, really interesting discussion today. Makes me feel a lot better about the robot doing my vacuuming so I can enjoy my cappuccino more and balance all of these complexities and roles in life. H.J. and Damon, how's everyone been at home? We're doing well. We're having a great discussion about accessibility and smart meters as well. Some people struggle to use them, although they do have them, which is really interesting. But they decided to make that switch as well. And we've had a great time in the chat generally as well. There's uh, <laughs> lots of links that we've been posting. I'm pasting the idea for abs on my hologram. So yeah. that's something I really want to see in the future. <laughs> I'll uh, help quite a bit. But uh, yeah, we've had a great time in the chat with everyone and uh, loads of people sharing some fantastic stuff. 
as always, if there's anything you think of after or uh, there's a link or resource you didn't quite catch, just email us, studenthub at open.ac.uk, and we'd love to get back to you just for your thoughts or feedback. And, uh, yeah, keep in touch with our Twitter as well, at Student Hub Live. And, as always, if you missed any of the sessions as well, our YouTube channel, and we'll post all the links for that in the chat. Well, HJ and Damon, thank you so much. That's been fabulous. And our next event for the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences is a showcase where we'll be featuring some of the new modules that will be available from this September-October start onwards. And there is also lots more information about various qualifications and specific modules that you can find out about from the Student Hub Live YouTube channel and also the FAS YouTube channel as well. Don't forget the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences have a fab Facebook page, which is a great way to stay connected. And all of today's session will be available on Catch Up very shortly after the show. But for now, thank you for watching and we hope to see you at another event in the near future very soon. Bye for now.